So after every podcast, what I do is I open up an app and I record this intro and it's kind of my way of like reflecting and thinking about what was shared, what ideas we're talking about, you know, like what's a title for this one. And I was thinking about something that we discussed in the podcast today, just thinking about how there's all these new opportunities that exist in our world and how some people are like really holding on to stuff and there's some good and there's some bad with this right and i actually distinctly talked about this picture that you see if you're watching this on youtube and if you're not you should um where this kid is actually in a bowling alley on an ipad playing bowling right and a lot of people just see this picture and go oh kids these days blah 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 whatever judgmental and then I think about, you know, watching, you know, pro athletes watch video of things and actually learn from the, from the, from the, the, what they're actually doing. And I, I thought about this when I was a kid, I played football for four years in high school. So we were in a small town in Humboldt, Saskatchewan. And I actually played, there was, there was I, the guy guess senior football because there was only one team, right? Because we couldn't have a varsity or I don't even know uh, the U.S. terms for this. But I played in grade 9, 10, 11, and 12. And I played the actual game of football. But there are so many things I had no clue about in the game of football until I started playing Madden and playing Madden on PlayStation and really understanding the strategy, how you deal with time management, all these weird things, right? And you would think like, oh, like there's no better way to learn than actually play the game. But I actually played the four that played for four years, but there was a lot of things I didn't understand because I actually, when you play the game of Madden, it's kind of like you're playing, but you're also the coach. And so you have to learn the rules. You have to learn strategy, all these different things. And so I think a lot of times we see that picture and we become very judgmental as opposed to like saying like, what are the benefits to this? And what are some of the things that are maybe detrimental and kind of understand this. And now, you know, some people like their whole career is actually playing Madden football. They've never played football, but they're very good at, uh, you know, the video game version. And so it's just kind of like having conversations about this, I think are really interesting. And that's why I really love talking today to Mark White. And he is a uh, former superintendent. He's taught um, very a lot of different things. He's a consultant currently. And he talks about this idea of leading disruptive times. And how do we actually deal with this stuff as we're, you know, people are continuously moving forward. And I think about not making anything black or white, but as I share in the podcast, really kind of living in the gray, asking questions, really trying to understand different points of view and how they're actually, uh, you know, beneficial to our students and to our own learning. So I think you're going to really love this podcast. I really enjoyed this conversation. I was blessed to um, have Dwight Carter suggest Mark join the podcast because of his mentorship. Dwight, Dwight actually uh, wrote about uh, Mark's influence and in, because of a teacher in the first edition. So it was really cool to have that connection, but it was a really uh, interesting conversation, really pushed my thinking. I think you're going to really enjoy it. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I'm so blessed to actually have Mark White join me. He was actually uh, a formerly a superintendent in Ohio. Uh, he's worked in Texas. Uh, he's worked in Ohio. He's now located in Florida and he travels and inspires people all over the world. And I actually first was uh, notified of uh, Mark because of my very good friend, Dwight Carter. And Dwight has, like, he's talked about you so many times about the impact that you've had on his career, all the work that you've done. And just sitting down and, and getting to talk to you a little bit, I can totally understand why. Well, thank uh, you. Yeah, it's just just absolutely a pleasure to meet you and connect with you. I actually, uh, I, I do this little trick. I have a, you know, I, everyone use, and people have this on Gmail, but they don't necessarily utilize it, but they have like a snooze. So you can like, so Dwight sent me an email, said you need to like get Mark on the podcast. And I was like, I'm going to, but I like was traveling and I don't record during that time. So he's like snoozed it and then it like popped up and I was actually back on the road. And I snoozed, I'm like, I am getting this guy on the podcast. Well, thank so you. I nice to see you here. I'm so blessed to have you. So, Mark, um, if you could just kind of introduce yourself to everybody, tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do today, and kind of how you got there, that'd be a great place to start. Yeah, well, well thank you, George, for having me. Uh, and thanks to Dwight for recommending me so highly. Uh, yeah, so um, I grew up in Texas on the Texas Gulf Coast in the shadow of oil refineries. 
um, somehow made it to Austin, lived in Austin. I was a high school English teacher, department chair, assistant principal, moved to Ohio, became a principal, assistant superintendent, superintendent. Mm. Um, and I've learned a lot about leadership, what to do, what not to do. Been blessed to work with a lot of great people. Uh, worked in China for a year. I didn't tell you that. I lived oh, in Beijing. Wow. Yeah, when I left being a superintendent, I just wanted something different. I filled in as interim administrators here and there in central Ohio for a while and moved to China. And I worked as an educator, a uh, administrator at the Beijing National Day School, uh, right in the middle of Beijing. It was a wonderful experience. Uh, so now I live in Florida. I consult. I've yeah. been cons consulting for my own, consulting for the International Center for Leadership and Education. I worked in schools from New York City to Los Angeles, lots of work in Texas and lots of places in between. Wow. I, yeah, that's that, that's a that's amazing uh, travel itinerary and uh, very, very cool. I, I'm going to ask you this. I've never asked anyone this before, but you said something that kind of piqued my interest. We always talk about, you know, the, the good things that we do in leadership. But you said, you know, I learned what not to do. So like, what's a what's a not to do? I'm actually curious what you'd say. Like, it may, is it something that you did? And you're like, oh, that no, don't do that again. <laughs> <That kind of thing. laughs> like, I've had those moments for sure, right? But is, like, what would you say? Like, you know, it maybe is a misperception. Like, here's something you should do that you're like, nah, don't don't actually do that. I, I think speed kills an administration sometimes, and that uh, if you make a decision too quickly. If you're in a hurry, if you want something done, you don't think it through, you don't handle it correctly in how you talk to somebody. Uh, one of my main mantras as an administrator is slow down. You don't want to drag it out forever. People need a decision, mm -hmm. but you don't want to be too fast. You have to think these things through, especially in this day and age. Yeah. They, so the first thing. OK, so the first thing I thought about um, when you brought this up is we were doing a um, I was really interested in the leader me, uh, the Covey stuff. And there's these schools that were leader and me schools, right? They're what I like. I can't, they're like lighthouse schools, they were called. And so I was like, I read the book, I was like bought into the program as a principal. And I was like, let's go, let's do this, right? And I remember this. And then I actually, um, we, there was a, a, an event where you could go see a leader and me school. And I took some staff there. And I like, my mind was made up when we left, right? And then we got there and we they, the school is amazing but there's just something weird about it that it was like okay hey, this is great for this school but i don't know if this is for us and i started kind of getting some of this and i remember um i talked to my staff who i brought there and i'm like what do you think and they're like oh it was awesome i'm like tell me what you thought don't don't tell me what you think you i want to hear tell me what you because they knew i was like all invested in it and they're like well, you know, I've, this is a little bit, I struggle with this. I struggle with this. I'm like, okay. So like, I, I think too, like, I think it's important sometimes that we say like the, the decisions that we were adamant about making, once we get the feedback, are we willing to change course? Right. Okay. Because, because I think sometimes, right. Sometimes our ego gets in the way. We're like, you know what? I know that's not best for the school, but I don't want to look like I, I made a, you know, a bad movement. And I think I would have regretted that if we went that way now we actually embrace some of the principles from the book and but we made it our own but i felt like mm -hmm. the other one was like you must do things this way if you want to be considered a lighthouse school and i'm like you know i'd be like a kind of a cool thing to say that we're that but is it really helping our kids like is that more about the adults and myself or is that really helping our students well you, you did something too george that was really unusual you consulted with your people <laughs> No, it's, it's, I, I would do yeah, that too. I, it's still I, amazing to me how people, yeah. superintendents and assistant superintendents and principals can put in a huge, announce a huge initiative or program, never talk to anybody about right. it and never consult with them and lay the groundwork and see what they're thinking and include them. And uh, you're, you're, we're so much stronger together. You know, I, I, okay, I learned don't announce anything until you talk to three or four teachers and the staff right. who are going to be leaders. What do you think? Pull them aside. What do you think? What do you think? Is this going to work or not? What kind of reaction am I going to get here? What's the history here? That sort of thing. Include the people around you. If you don't do that, you're not going to get things done, especially today. Yeah. And if you include people around you and it's a terrible decision, it's their fault. <laughs> <laughs> right? Was, hey, you all decided this. <laughs> this wasn't me. Uh, no, you know that's not true. But oh, yeah. we, we do joke about that, right? Like, Because I know, like, honestly, great leaders often give credit and they take blame. Like that's something that I think is, I was always 
uh, really try to do that. But yeah, like to me, that I, I appreciate you picking that out because I think for some people that's just kind of second nature and some people that is just not in their nature, right? And that's something that's really important. So I got to ask you, um, you, you kind of just briefly talked about this. I want to just talk about your, uh, uh, you said something I've never heard of before. It, you talked about your book, Five Gen Leadership. Mm -hmm. and said leading five generations of the schools in the 2020s. And you actually named a lot of the generations that I heard of, but there was one I've ne that's new. I've never heard of this before. And so can you just talk a little bit about the book and yeah. the five generations and what, what that's about? Yeah, that would be the new one's probably Gen Alpha, the, the, yeah. the kids in fourth and fifth grade and on down. Yeah, so I was leading this uh, training in the South Texas. And I do this generational exercise because I want I break people, the group up by generation, because I want them to understand where they are in relation to their Gen Z and Gen Alpha students. Right. And so I, we have Gen Z teachers now. A lot of people don't understand that Gen Zers, the ones up to 25 or 26, are now in our teaching staff. They're not all just millennials. These right. are Gen Z. And so I have these three Gen Z teachers. And I said, hey, if you could change professional development, what would you change? About 50 people in the room, they're all looking at these three babes in the woods teachers, right? right, right. And this one teacher bravely says, sometimes I wish that the trainers would just leave us alone and let us go figure it out. Right. And that struck me. It was an epiphany for me because I've, worked, I've been in several thousand classrooms the last five years. And I kept picking up on something in my training about the younger teachers. This is the figure it out generation. Mm -hmm. And they've been figuring it out their whole lives from their apps to their surfing, to the games they play. They don't read directions. They're right. not used to people telling them how to do things. They want to go figure it out. On the far extreme or the baby boomers like me, please tell me step by step, how do you want me to do this? What is it supposed to look like when I get through? Huh. And in between, you've got the Gen Xers and you've got the millennials who are sort of in between. The millennials are more like the Gen Z. The Xers are more like the boomers. And that's mm -hmm. because... The Xers and the boomers, the older people, grew up without the Internet. I call that the Internet Valley. And the millennials and the Gen Zers grew up surfing and seeing the whole world on their phones and computers and tablets. Mm -hmm. And they're bringing different views, different ways of doing things into the schools today, into the workforce today. That, you know, the when you're bringing up the notion of, like, let me figure it out, I think one of the advantages that I've had in my career is I, I actually went to become a kindergarten teacher and I made a website in university and that making that website was like, basically I was Einstein right <laughs> during education. Like nobody was doing anything with technology. It was so new. So I actually at a kindergarten interview, I got a high school technology job because wow. of the website. Right. And I was like, are you kidding? Like, and I hate, I was like kind of anti-technology, but I did it because I had to do it for something. And, uh, and basically that, like that, my whole first year of teaching was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I got to figure this stuff out. And I had no one to teach me. And I was a little bit like, boy, they're hiring me because of my expertise and I'm the most expert person. I have no idea what I'm doing with this stuff. And so I kind of learned to figure stuff out, but I was never hesitant to like, say it like in a class, like to my students, like. Hey, does anyone know how to do this? Right? Like, does anyone know? And yeah. I never, and I actually felt it actually gave me a credibility that I was willing to ask versus <laughs> not knowing and looking like an idiot in front of my students. <laughs> and they're like, well, we actually know how to do this. Why don't you just help, you know? And I think there's part of that too. It's not just necessarily figuring stuff out. And I think that um, I am kind of driven that way. And I know I don't, I don't, I'm like kind of a, I think I'm a, like a middle, like I could like kind of go into one of the two categories. I can't remember which one, but uh, I think I'm like, what it's millennial. I'd be like in between millennial and what's the other one? Mill uh, up above what's the older one other than millennial. Gen X. Gen X. I, mean, I can't remember from Gen, what I can't remember that. And like that, and we both know this, right? Not everyone fits stereotypically into each category, but there are some like commonalities between oh, yeah, yeah, what, yeah. what we say there. But yeah, like I, I, I appreciate uh, kind of seeing this, but what about like, what about gen alpha? That's the one I've never heard. So what, like, what do you, what have you found, you know, in your work about that? Alpha the, began in around 2010, 2011. Okay. And they were given that name by Mark McCrindle, the researcher in, I believe, New Zealand, who does so much with demographics and studies and everything like that. And he named them alpha because the beginning, uh, we went, somehow we went all the way to Z they didn't think this through very well. Okay. We had to do something after Z. So we came up with alpha 
uh, alpha as in the beginning. Uh, yeah. Also alpha, uh, that's also the year that the iPads were coming out. So we talk about Gen Z being this digital generation. I think alpha is going to be even more advanced mm. uh, in terms of what they expect, what they want, what they're seeing in the world right now. I even saw something the other day. They're studying why kids are, be, are having puberty earlier. And don't oh. know if that has anything to do with all this, but I mean, they're exposed to so much in the world. They're called the up agers because every, they're, getting, they're seeing everything on the Internet and experiencing things at an earlier age. Right. That I don't. That's like, I don't know if that's exciting or scary. Right? No, I, it's, I, I think it's kind of scary, Yeah. Uh, but that feeds right into the, the Z is sort of like that. But that's because if you're going to lead Gen Z or Gen Alpha, uh, you better be real. You better be authentic. You better be transparent. They're going to because they see so much. They see so much stuff on the Internet. That's not true. If you're not true, right. they're going to look you right in with that. So I, I was uh, I was actually just with uh, working with a group of parents this past week and I talk about a lot of the stuff that kids are seeing, what they're sharing. And I actually talk about the possibilities too. And mm -hmm. the, the, it was funny because one of the parents, like I took some Q and a after, and I actually know one of the educators and uh, he came with his wife and his wife actually said, why didn't he talk about like all the negative stuff? Blah, blah, blah. And she's like, well, he's kind of limited for time. Like you can't talk about everything. And like, we've heard the negative stuff already. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like I was disregarding it and saying, don't pay attention to it. But I, but I, I like I, the, the question that kind of kept coming up and we were sharing in this process was that like there, there is just more opportunity here too, but there's also more issues. There's more problems mm -hmm. that can arise too. And so you cutting your kids off from this stuff is also cutting off their opportunities, but you just letting them go on their own is also an issue. Right. And it's kind of like, and I said, there. I know a lot of people want me just to be black and white, but I. this is the thing I always say, there is no black and white here. It's all gray, but you got to be in the gray. Like you got to be involved in that. Is that something that you found with this stuff? Oh, is yeah. That, yeah, I, I think so much this is living in the gray. I use that term also. There's no yeah. black and white. Yeah. You, you can't cut them off. Uh, you know, they, they want it. They thrive on it. They can't go into areas they shouldn't be going. You have to limit, I think, what they're doing. Try to limit the screen time as best you can. But here's what we have to remember, too. If you're cutting them off, they have to pick it up eventually because this is going to be their life. Yeah. We're not talking about just 2022. Mm -hmm. They're going to be alive into the 22nd century here. OK, I mean, mm -hmm. they're going to be the first generation to see, you know, uh, 2100. Mm -hmm. And their, their prime of their life could be 2060, 2070. What is the world going to be like then? It's not going to be analog. It's going right. to be digital. Right. And so it's about digital dexterity. Uh, it's about working you know, the digital, digital tools into their curriculum as best you can without having it monopolized. Not everything is on technology. But I think we have to tell teachers this. I ask this question all the time. I say, now, if you're a young teacher, you're going to teach for 30, 35, 40 years, maybe today. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you start in 2022, you're going to be retiring in 2052 or 2062. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine what your classroom is going to be like then? Oh. What's the world going to be like? Will we still be teaching and reading and writing as we do now? Math? AI is going to be so strong. Will we be doing everything through AI? What is teaching going to look mm -hmm. like in the decades ahead? Yeah, like, like I, I always kind of struggle with this in the sense that I like people say, oh, people are so good with technology. I'm like, are we really? Like, or is this technology so easy now, right? So like when I, I, I grew up, we had an Apple IIc. I was really good with technology then because if you could, if you weren't good with technology, that thing was useless to you, right? Like yeah, I didn't know how to program. I didn't know like figure stuff out. I don't know how to program anymore. Like I don't know how to do any of that stuff. And you kind of mentioned this on the other podcast that we were kind of talking about this. You know, we have like this, or actually on this one where you're talking about like kids figuring out and like they don't read instructions. A lot of people don't realize this and it's like iPhones do not come with instructions. There is no booklet. It is right. basically uh, when when Steve Jobs created it, it was basically I want to be able to pull it out of the box, not have instructions and be so intuitive. And so I, I kind of always like struggle with this is that are we making stuff so easy that it's actually dumbing us down? Because my like I said, my knowledge of technology was way more because this is like, you know, starting a podcast is not as hard as it was maybe 10, 15 years ago. Right. Uh, kind of doing this like i send you a link we press on it i press the button record 
Uh, but like, you know, recording Dallas on Thursday nights when I was a kid on my VCR was like a complex yeah. problem of like how to like, you know, like having like timer set and, you know, all this other stuff. And I can't just like tell my phone how to do this. So like, do you, do you ever have that concern that, you know, as a technology advances, like what, what are we losing in our own wisdom and intelligence through that process? Yeah. I, I, and see, I think, yeah. What are we losing and how will we use it? Will we use it ethically? Will we use it to create or to destroy? Right. right. And I think it goes back so much to what we need to be doing now and foster this sense of looking at the upper end of Bloom's taxonomy, looking at be, mm. having kids evaluate and create. You know, are we fostering that or just fostering test taking skills that often end at the analysis level? Because, you know, they're not going to remember so much what we what they were taught today. They can Google up what, what we're teaching today pretty much in the future. But they will have to have the growth mindset, the creative mindset yep. to do great things with the technology that is coming and to do it ethically. And if we can do that with kids today in any country in the world, that is a huge, powerful, positive accomplishment. Yeah. And I, I think that depth matters too, right? Like when these things become easier, that gives us the ability to focus more on like going beyond surface level ideas. And I'll, I'll give you an example. When, when I was a, a principal, we went to digital portfolios and we actually used a blogging platform to utilize digital portfolios because we didn't want it just to be video and audio, even though you could do those things, but we want our kids to consistently write. And so they were writing in this um, blog, but then not only were they writing into it, they were actually getting comments from each other. And then they were like learning how to respond to the comments because it's open, anyone can see it. And so they were actually writing a ton. And I remember actually one of my parents saying like, you're not even teaching kids how to write anymore. I'm like, do you mean cursive write or write? Because they're actually writing way more than they ever have. Mm -hmm. But if you're talking about cursive writing, we do teach it, but not to the extent that we did when I was in school. But and we're focused on how do you read it? And I know people get really weird when you talk about cursive writing. Like it's mm -hmm. like there's like a cult with cursive writing, uh, and they'll like people will find. I actually did an interview on cursive writing, and I wasn't like against it, but I was like, you know, we shouldn't focus on as much as more. And oh my god, the hate comments I've got! Like <laughs> it was like it was it was horrible. It was so bad. And I thought people were gonna like like graffiti my house but in cursive right you know like and then and then i wouldn't be able to read it because you know i don't understand cur i'm just kidding so the uh so i think that part of it was like are, are you focusing on like cursive writing or writing because we actually saw the kids were writing more but but isn't touching on that isn't that one of the sacred cows yeah See, oh, totally. and that's what we're talking about here i mean you, you what are you going to give up you got to give up something to move forward yeah. what are you replacing it with you know, I, I read uh, where Gen Alpha might be the first generation when they become adults that they could spend more time in a virtual world than they can in the real world. Right. Doing what? I don't know. But I mean, just think of how we get lost now in our Xboxes and Playstations. <laughs> Kids get lost now. That's going to continue. Just they'll be walking into game rooms in their homes that are all virtual reality around them. So, I mean, but what are they going to be doing with it? Are they just be doing that? Uh, I, I, I believe in the human spirit. And I believe that people will still want to create. They'll want to read. I think they'll want to write. Um, I think those things are innate. We'll, we'll just see. We'll see. There's actually like this uh, picture that I remember. It was like kind of funny. And there's a kid at a bowling alley on his iPad playing bowling on the iPad, but not bowling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, and I just thought it was like, you know, whatever i don't know it was just kind of like an interesting thing like the kid was literally sitting where, where you keep score and he was just playing bowling on his ipad now again we don't know the context of the situation maybe the kid was like learning angles you know to like better prepare himself and kind of do some stuff but it's just like a it's kind of a funny picture right so this is actually leads beautifully into your other book that you actually wrote with dwight uh, leading schools in disruptive times. So we there's a lot of disruption that's happening. And mm -hmm. a lot of times um, it's done to us, but I think a lot of times we have the opportunity to do it ourselves. And right. I, th I think for me, that's always the better way, right? Like lead, right. lead change as opposed to change being forced upon you. So can you, can you just tell us a little bit about the book and kind of what the message is and, and what you're hoping that it achieves? Yeah, well, see, in the book, we espouse this philosophy of C-A-T, CAT, Cope, adjust, transform. And that's what you just said. We can do it if we stay ahead of it. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so many times the disruptions come at us and we don't know why it happened. We cope with it. Mm -hmm. Something happens in our school, a new social media platform or some sort of new type of threat or something like that, or something maybe even good might come in. And we're thinking, wow, that's kind of interesting. We might take the next step of adjusting. We cope and then we adjust. We might adjust our policies. We might uh, really begin to adjust some of our actions, how we do things, trying to stay ahead of it. But we don't take the time to transform. Mm -hmm. And transforming is when you look at why did this happen? How, why did this kid do this? And where did this technology come from? And I think it's all going back to understanding the disruptions. And a lot of the disruptions are coming because of hyper change. And the hyper change is coming because of Moore's law. And with Moore's law, uh, Moore predicted back in the 60s that processing speeds would be doubling every 18 to 24 months. Mm -hmm. That continued up to about 2014, 15. Now we're into quantum computing. That led to a doubling of knowledge. IBM came out in 2012 and said knowledge would be doubling every 12 months in the near future. Wow. Some people think that's happening now. It's a lot faster than 12 months. Uh, and it, no, I'm sorry, it's, it's been 12 months. They said it'd be every 12 hours. Uh, wow. And yeah, and so some people think it's, it's pretty close to that right now. That's why we have all these new gadgets. So if we as leaders and teachers can understand that this is going to keep going. I mean, it's not like the progress is stopping, technology is stopping. We have to look ahead and say, what's going to be happening in 2025, 2030, 35, 40? And how do we get ready for that now? What can we do with our rigor, with our relevance, how we're using technology, how we're involving our parents? Uh, this has led to a lot of the splintering, I think, in society. Mm -hmm. You know, some people want to go back to the way things were. Some people say, no, we have to keep moving forward. It's scaring some people. Mm -hmm. We have these huge battles going on over curriculum over books in the library, over masks. Um, it's it's all because people are being exposed so much more through social media. They're sharing things. Right. Social media came out in 29 and 2009, 2010. So, I mean, it's all sped up. And if we understand why things are speeding up, it's going to keep speeding up. We won't be surprised. We'll keep transforming. Yeah. I, like, I, I think about this a lot of times is that the idea is that we, we all have the ability to share our voice with the world. It doesn't mean we have to all the time either. And I think a lot of times it's really beneficial to step back and just kind of like take in some information that, you know, as the world progresses so quickly, it doesn't mean that you necessarily have to like try to keep up with everything. And you watch like a lot of news organizations, uh, they have gone from the notion of being right, not being as important as being first. And then a lot of times being first doesn't mean that you're right. Right. And that, that's, a, that's kind of a problem is that are they actually digging into that information? But it's like, what, what is actually, you know, what actually gets clicks? What actually gets media? And I think a question I'm asked all the time is that, like, what do you see as being different in 10 years from now? I said, I don't know, neither do you. And nobody does, right? What I do know is that if you teach people how to learn, they'll, mm -hmm. and, and they'll be able to deal with it. And I think that's what the biggest focus is, is not that, hey, 10 years, you better be ready for this. It's like, how do you, 10 years, you better be ready to continuously learn because that, that will never change. Yeah. I, I tell everybody, check the verbs in your standards, mm -hmm. you know, and look at Bloom's taxonomy and see where they are. You know, a study came out when the uh, common core first came out years ago mm -hmm. and it talked about how a lot of the verbs stopped at the analysis level, a lot of remembering too much remembering probably right. uh, because people fight over what should be in a curriculum. We should know certain characters. I'm not saying you shouldn't know certain characters, but again, what are those sacred cows? You know, you can't learn, remember every character. That's why we have Google these days, seriously. Uh, but we have to be able to evaluate and create. Analyzing is what is a way they can make standardized test, testing that can be easily graded. Mm -hmm. Evaluation, creativity is a totally different model of testing. That's where we need to be going. So you're right. If we get them to evaluate and create and think at the upper levels, right. they'll be much happier, much more prosperous in the future, I think. They, yeah, they might still get there. But they won't be playing catch up because we didn't let them get there in school. Right, right, right. The, the, what, there's this uh, quote. It was, I, It's like it's a meme. I don't know where it originally came from. I, I share it. And it's, it said, uh, tradition is peer pressure from dead people. And I think it's like, <laughs> one of my, it's like I, I use it to like kind of like make people feel uncomfortable. But I always distinguish this, right? And I'll say, but I'm not against tradition, by the way, when I say this. So, and I always use the analogy. So storytelling is probably the oldest mm -hmm. practice in teaching and learning, 
mm -hmm. is actually telling stories. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's gone past through cultures. It's, you know, but also this podcast that we have right now, we're telling stories, mm -hmm. but we're also connecting it in a different way. So like there is some very, there's traditional aspects here, but we're able to relate it in a totally different way than we could 10, 15, 30 years ago. Right. And so I think part of the thing that I always say is I, I'm not against tradition, but what I am against is doing things we've always done just because we've done them. That's where I struggle is that, and that's where some of the disconnect is, is that we just want to keep this thing. And I say, well, like, tell me why. Right. And I think schools struggle with that because, you know, we do award ceremonies, not necessarily because they're good, but because we've always done them. Right. And I'm not against that, but can you articulate in 2022, why do you still do award ceremonies? Like, can you actually, I'm not saying like, I, that's a, I think a legitimate question to ask schools. Like do, why do we still do grading the way we did 10, 15, 20 years ago? Like, I'm not saying we shouldn't, but I'm saying if you do it, can you articulate why? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's, you're right. It's tradition. It's peer pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as a teacher years ago, uh, my gosh, that would have been 30 years ago. I quit giving grades in my high school English class. We did nothing but a portfolio. And it really scared the heck out of some of the teachers around me. My principal let me do it. My district, Leander, let me do it. They encouraged me to do it. We were into that. Uh, but I had one person leaving nasty notes on my desk because uh, I scared him so it much. Like, it was the curse of people. I think I know who it was. He, he would <laughs> average his grades out to the third decimal point, you know. Right. And so he would leave something on my desk of an article or something saying, Mark, are you still not? Are you still not giving grades? You know, and I learned there are two ways of asking a question. Mark, are you still not giving grades? Which is accusatory or Mark, are you still not giving grades? Which is more of how's it going? Right. You know, so I think if we ask somebody, do, deal, deal with somebody on the outside or in our organization doing something different, let's think about how we're asking the question. Is it accusatory or is it because you really want to know and really want to have a conversation? Yeah, they, it, it, it's funny you said about the portfolio. So I actually, uh, I teach a, a graduate course with University of Pennsylvania. And I actually do the same thing. I do portfolios and I, we don't give grades. Uh, we have, we do more like, I guess the, the best way I can explain it, because I'm not, I don't necessarily know if I have the, is that I met, I mean the feedback to be more conversational because mm -hmm. these are all adults. These mm -hmm. are all, uh, like people that know more stuff in their field than I do, right? Like I'm teaching my course, but I always encourage them to connect it to the work that they're doing currently. And the one thing that I say to them, I was like, if you go through this process and you like not getting grades, you like having conversation, that's great. But how do you actually do it with students? If you think it's really awesome for your learning, mm -hmm. then I need you, because I think part of the problem that we've always kind of had is that a generation, and like you talk about the different generations, but even the even the newer generations coming into to education, a lot of them bring on the old practice because oh, yeah. that's the way they learned, or that's sort of that's the way they, I shouldn't say learn. That's the way they did school, right? Yeah. So like, even though they might have learned different, they still replicate school, right? And, and yeah, and they might have been successful in the in the system. Yeah. You know, I always tell the teachers we love school so much we became teachers. Yeah. You know, it, it fit, fit us beautifully. Maybe our grades weren't the greatest sometimes or something like that, but still we love school and that's why we're here. Right. Uh, you're right. Um, we, we have to, they want to conform, um, but we have to, we have to foster a sense of creative creativity in the staff. Also, we talk about that for the students all the time. Same thing for the students are, right. our, are our teachers, are they just applying what they've been taught to do? Are they actually evaluating and creating new ways of going, doing it and going forward? Yeah, the, the, the example I always use is, has anyone ever said this to a group of students? The bell doesn't dismiss you, I dismiss you. Because I didn't make that up, but I said it, and because it was said to me as a kid, and right. you know who's, and it was my teacher, my teacher didn't make it up. So even before social media, someone said it to that teacher when they were a kid, and it's just passed down generation after generation, right? But right. I was like, yeah, like, hey, if you say that, I said, you know, the days I've said that, I sucked because kids were like bolting to get out of my classroom as fast as possible, right? Hey, so Mark, we're going into a new school year and I would just love for like, you know, a lot of people, the majority of people I've talked to, if not everybody said like the 2021, 20, 22 school year was way harder than the year prior, right? right? So we're going into this new school year. What's the best advice you can give to people as they enter this year? I would say let's hope it is a little bit easier. I heard that also. Everybody, so many people told me this was the toughest year of their career. 
Mm -hmm. They came back after the COVID shutdown thinking this year would be back to normal. Right. I think people need to go into the next school year thinking this is the new normal. Right. Now, we might not have as many COVID closures and as many cases, but we don't know. But I think that everything has been disrupted. Uh, our mindsets have been disrupted, how we do school. And let's remember this, too. All the data is coming out about what's going on with depression in our students and our teachers and our adult administrators. Mm -hmm. We have to keep that in mind also. So that said, in summary, I would expect another difficult year. Um, but I would say, OK, we can look at this as a difficult year or a chance to embrace having fun, growing mm -hmm. with the kids and doing things differently. And that often comes from the leadership down to the teacher. And the teacher has to be open to saying, OK, how can I adjust my practices and not just do it because I've always done it like this? These are not the times to be doing things just because you've always done it like that, unless it still works well. Right. And, you know, I, I know a good book on this topic would be called uh, Leading Schools in Disruptive Times, which you obviously are an expert at. Because Yes, that would work. I uh, I uh, I thoroughly enjoy talking to you. I really appreciate it. I'm so I'm like I'm a little bit bothered that I didn't connect with you sooner, but oh. I was traveling. So I, I'm I'm glad that we had this chance. Um, anyone listening, you can actually see uh, Mark's books, Leading Schools in D Disruptive Times, and Five Gen Leadership in the links down below. Mark, thanks so much for taking the time to to chat with me today and share your knowledge with our audience. Well, thank you so much, George. Love talking with you. Anytime, have me back. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day.